Hi, I'm Jan Bitkowski. I'm director of the Banbury Centre here at Coursebury Harp Laboratory. And this is the fourth day of the 81st annual Coalspring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. And the subject this year is targeting cancer. And so I have with me one of the eminent, preeminent cancer researchers, <laughs> whom I've known a long time, uh, Louise Parada, uh, formerly at UT Southwest and recently moved to Memorial Sloan Kettering. So Louise, I was talking to Bob Weinberg and Harold Varmus a little bit about the start of all this, of all the sort of the cancer gene work. Um, Harold, of course, through the through the viral oncogenes, and, and Bob and, and you uh, doing the first, with, with some others, doing the first human oncogenes. And you were just saying you were a second year graduate student at that time. I was. I was. It was an exciting time. Did did you? Did you as a graduate student have any sense of what this was going to lead on to? I don't think that I was that uh, clairvoyant about the future, but the excitement was absolute and instantaneous. Um, I recall as a first year graduate student at MIT, we did not rotate through laboratories the way most uh, graduate programs work. Instead, <clears throat> we took coursework and then we listened to seminars from the faculty. Mm -hmm. And when um, an assistant professor by the name of Robert Weinberg mm -hmm. got up and said, um, we can take DNA from tumor cells and put it into normal cells and they become tumorigenic, and then we can take the DNA and clip it with ECOR1 and they still are tumorigenic, but when we clip it with BAMH1, mm -hmm. it loses its tumorigenic capacity. I said, it's a gene. Cancer is a gene, and at that moment, I said, I need to go work with Robert Weinberg, and it's the best decision I ever made yeah. in my career. And, you know, and you're you're referring to you know, clipping with Eco R1, and <laughs> it retained its its transforming ability, and cutting with Bam H1. I mean, I, I guess restriction enzymes are still used, but they're probably not quite the, a primary tool in the, the, the way they were. That's, that's rudimentary molecular biology. We had to, you know, purify our own restriction enzymes in the beginning mm. um, before New England biolabs started okay. selling them and right. <laughs> took care of it for us. Right. And I looked at the paper. Uh, what was your primary technique that you used in that, in the that southern, 1982 paper? The southern blot, which again I think is a thing of the past, but uh, the southern blot permitted us for the first time to begin to look at sort of genomic pieces of DNA uh, visually. Mm -hmm. And, and, and really it was the key to what was my central project as a PhD student, which was to beg the question, are the genes, the transforming genes that we were seeing in human cells related to the oncogenes that were resident in retroviruses that were sort of the heart of the cancer field at that time. These RNA tumor viruses that caused cancer. And, and the answer was resoundingly yes. Yep. Yep. The, other, the other, I think, noticeable thing about that 1982 paper is there's not a single DNA sequence in it. No. I don't think so. No, no. The, the sequel was the sequence of the, uh, of the amino acid 12 mutation in RAS. That was the sequel by my good friend and colleague, Cliff Taven. How long, how long was the sequence? How, how much? What was the total amount of DNA that was sequenced? Oh, I think, I think uh, maybe think? a thousand bases. Yes. And, it, was, and it, it required a collaboration. <laughs> we couldn't do it all by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, come back to you. <laughs> you saying how exciting it was doing that. Um, there was also a bit of a race on at the time, wasn't there? There was Mike Wiggler's Correct. Lab. Correct. There was Jeff Cooper. Right. Um, Bob Acid. Yes, I mean, we were aware of, of Jeff Cooper's work, which was orthogonal to ours, in the sense that he wasn't seeing the same things that we were seeing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were aware of Mike Wiggler's work because uh, Mitch Goldfarb was a Bob Weinberg graduate student mm -hmm. and then he came to postdoc with Mike Wigler at the Cold Spring Har Harbor Laboratories and pursued the same line of work. So we were aware th of that Mike was, Wigler's group was going along the lines. We were not aware of Mariano's work mm -hmm. we, until it came out. So he, he was not, uh, you know, we weren't in discussion with him at the time. We simply weren't aware. Yeah, yeah fascinating stuff. But there. it was a race. But, but the race was, it was a funny race in the sense that we didn't know the answer. It, it wasn't sort of like the race to 
for example, identify the structure of DNA, where there is a structure and mm. we're going to find it. It was more, we were all trying to figure out how to clone mm. cancer genes once we realized that there was right. such a thing. So in a way it was exploratory. I mean, it was, it, Correct. you really didn't know Correct. what, what yeah. you were going to turn it's up. Exactly. You got results and then have to interpret them and use those results to go on to the, uh, Correct. To the next bit. Yes. They are fascinating. So uh, let, let's wind, uh, wind the clock forward a certain number of years, which we didn't, didn't go into, about your, your recent stuff. Um, so, as I understand it, so you, you've been working on glioblastomas Correct. for a while, and as I understand it, one of, your, one of your key findings is that glioblastomas don't arise from glial cells, but arise from a special set of neural stem cells. That Correct. Can, Correct. So, yes, so, so you summarize correctly, and, and, and to, to take a, a larger view of the problem, um, as, as someone who has always been interested in the developmental biology aspects of disease and as, as to the natural history of how tumors evolve, um, for many years I've been frustrated by the fact that there are so many textbooks that claim to tell us where and how cancer arises mm -hmm. when there has actually been very little, if any, direct investigation into the origins of cancer. Uh, and in fact, the only really important and, and, and fact-finding trips of that sort have been done in the hematopoietic system. So how, how hematopoietic stem cells are the root of most leukemias. Mm -hmm. And so in solid tumors, that's really uncharted territory until really the last years. And um, what we decided to do, um, because I've spent many years studying the development of the brain and of the nervous system, was to tackle that problem in tumors of the nervous system. And what we decided to do was to generate uh, genetically engineered mouse models that harbored the mutations that were most frequently found in sporadic glioblastoma, mm -hmm. an incurable tumor mm -hmm. of the brain in humans. And when we did this, we discovered that when we made the mutations in a certain way, 100% of the mice developed glioblastoma that the neuropathologists at the hospital could not distinguish from the human disease, whereas we did it in a certain other way, we never got glioblastoma. Mm -hmm. And, and, and mm -hmm. what was one way and what was the other way? Well, it was when we m mutated the gene in the stem cells of the brain versus any other cell in the brain. And so we came to the conclusion that this is a disease of stem cells and, and, that, and that analogous to what is known in many hematopoietic cancers, the mutations actually accumulate in the stem cells and the disease is manifested in some cell that resembles some normal product of the stem cell. But that's just, um, if you will, the dressing. Yeah. It's not the source and the core. The core is actually that there's a unique and important property of stem cells that we refer to as self-renewal. And self-renewal means that these cells are immortal. As long as you and I are alive, thankfully, we have stem cells in our brain that we need and, and in our blood that we need. Well, that's the, uh, the analogy with cancer cells. Cancer cells are also immortal. So, so, does that, so that presumably implies that the that the standard treatments of chemotherapy and radiation that are directed at the bulk of the tumor are really misdirected. What you need to do is to get the, that stem cell or those small number of cells. The, the key implication is what you just said. The implication is that we've devised a series of chemo and radiotherapies that were designed on purpose to kill proliferating cells, cells that divide aggressively. Mm. The consequence of that is that all anti-cancer therapies, in quotes, are not really anti-cancer therapies. They distinguish not between a cancer cell and a normal cell. Yeah. They distinguish between a dividing cell and a non-dividing cell. Ergo, all of the terrible consequences that are side effects of chemotherapy. Interestingly, as we lose our hair and become anemic and get gastrointestinal problems from chemotherapy, as soon as the chemotherapy is re removed, our hair grows back, our blood comes back, and our mm -hmm. digestive problems go away. Why? Because the chemotherapy, in addition to targeting the proliferating cells yeah. in the tumor, targets the proliferating cells in our normal stem cell compartments, but not the stem cells, which is why we can grow our hair back, 
which is why we recover from anemia and which is why the tumors come back because the stem cells were never touched by the therapy. So, so you said this hadn't really been resolved for solid tumors, tumors mainly in hematopoietic Correct, cells. and the leukemias. Right. Are there, are, are there other examples from solid tumors of the sort of um, there are there are emergent examples. So I, there are now several groups around the world who who um, have taken the same developmental biology approaches that we have, and in my view, have convincingly demonstrated the stem cell of origin for um, skin cancer mm -hmm. um, and also for colon cancer. Um, in addition, um, I think that there are now very good uh, evidence is coming forth for cancers of the liver and cancers of the bladder as being a, s a stem cell of origin cancer and moreover having a cancer stem cell um, as, as the driving force in this hierarchical tumor growth which, which was really something that was not appreciated until recently. Right. And, and so this, this question in a way may be, may be too early or self-evident. Um, so you, one wants to target the, the stem cells, the uh, apparent stem cells. Correct. Um, does your research or are the clues as to what the target might be? Well, there are the indeed. I mean, I, 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 I cannot emphasize enough how important the turning of the corner and realizing that there is a cancer stem cell and that there is a hierarchical method of tumor growth. Uh, how, how important that is as, a, uh, as an uh, advancement because it means that we now understand who the enemy is. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand the enemy to therefore isolate it, understand it, and then target it. So we can do this now with glioblastoma and we have in our laboratory, our research team is making great advances and we have what we believe are quite promising strategies that directly target the cancer stem cell um, and not uh, normal dividing cells. I should just say a seaplane has just flown down the uh, down the harbour. That's so right. We missed those pearls of wisdom from Louise. I, <laughs> anyway, it wasn't that important. Better. So, but but um, do stem cells have particular molecular characteristics that you can? Do we already know particular molecular characteristics of stem cells that we could? that could be used? Um, so, so the answer is uh, yes and no. So we know certain, there are certain common denominator properties of stem cells that are held within all stem cells, from embryonic stem cells to blood stem cells to skin stem cells, and also to cancer stem cells. The problem is that that's not what we want to target, because when I cure your tumor, I don't want to kill all of your hematopoietic stem mm -hmm. cells. So those common denominators are not ideal targets. However, in what we are learning now, similar to what is well understood or better understood in the hematopoietic system, cancer stem cells acquire certain properties that are quite unique. So they, they're, they're stem cells on steroids, right. if you will. Right. And so what we have to target is the steroids. And, and that's doable, I think, conceptually. And so maybe the next time that the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium has cancer as a theme, maybe I will be back here and I'll be able to tell you about those therapists. <laughs> Louis, thank you very much. I think probably we should, we should call it a, call an end to the interview given what's going on outside. Thank you very much. Sure. <laughs>